from the sweeping plains of Patagonia to the great outback down under. On Nova Scotia's rugged shores, above China's landlocked deserts, on man-made islands across the oceans of the world, and in the heart of newly emerging economies, there's a global company whose name has become a recognized brand for industry-leading products, total energy solutions, and unparalleled customer support. A company whose 75-year history was forged on a tradition of personal commitment and can-do attitude. Solar Turbines Incorporated, 75 years in the making and getting better all the time. Today's Solar Turbines Incorporated has undergone 75 years of growth, change, and development never even dreamed of when the doors first opened. In fact, 75 years ago, the company wasn't even called Solar. In 1927, it was Pruden San Diego Aircraft Company, formed by Henry Pruden and six San Diego businessmen who scraped together $60,000. Pruden took over a fish cannery, converted it into a shop, and built a plane, the XM-1, an all-metal trimotor. It flew, but it never sold. So Pruden built another, the SE-1, a single-engine design this time. The plan was to build a whole series of planes, one of the company's board of directors, an advertising man, thought it would be catchy to change the name of the company to Solar and name each of the planes after the planets orbiting the sun, like Mars and Mercury and Jupiter. Catchy, but Solar Aircraft now had two planes that couldn't sell. Pruden decided to move on from Solar, leaving behind his successful drive to build San Diego's Lindbergh Field Airport. His greatest legacy to Solar was recruiting an earnest young man who had become pivotal in shaping the company's destiny. Edmund Ned Price brought enthusiasm, experience in banking and finance, and $20,000 of his own money into the job. Price took charge of the company, and Solar finished its third plane, the MS-1. Charles Lucky Lindbergh had just returned from his world-famous flight across the Atlantic. He took the MS-1 for a test spin, liked it, praised its design and stability. But a cash-strapped company faced an ominous global problem. As Ned Price put it, we hit the depression right on the nose. You couldn't sell planes and you couldn't borrow money. We were in serious trouble. As the depression continued, Price's diary recorded how bad things were. He'd make hundreds of unsuccessful sales calls, beg the bank not to foreclose, avoid the county tax collector, and meet payroll by borrowing from family and friends. Price still had to lay off employees until there were only six men left. Price thought about quitting, offered his resignation to the board, but it wasn't accepted. And most company stories would end right there. And during the depression of the 30s, many did. But it's out of these origins that the solar of today was forged. Price heard about a Navy contract to build two exhaust manifolds for a couple of planes stationed at North Island. He seized the opportunity. Total value of the contract? 500 bucks. Not much. So the guys in the plant did everything they could. They made frying pans and milk cans, anything to keep the doors open. Then, as they say in the movies, at the darkest hour, an opportunity. Boeing aircraft liked Solar's exhaust manifolds. They placed a $5,000 order. 
Price called the men together. No money for materials, no money for payroll until the work was completed. No one knows for sure what employee Bill James actually said, but it must have been something like, let's get to work. Price pleaded to get the steel, brought sandwiches to the guys in the shop, and the manifolds were delivered on time. Even with back pay and small bonuses, the company had enough left to keep the doors open. An opportunity had led to a solution. Solar aircraft hung together through the Depression. Glory be, 1935. A profit. The first profitable year in Solar's history. Only $8,000, but a profit. And a good year for Ned Price, too. For the first time in his eight years with the company, he got a salary. That's right, he had spent eight years without drawing a paycheck. Solar's reputation for working with stainless steel and its expertise in manufacturing manifolds kept building. By 1936, the company had 100 employees and needed to expand operations along Harbor Drive. By 39, it was up to 200 employees. 75% of all U.S. planes used Solar manifolds. Price traveled to Europe to expand the company's sales. He found out that the company's reputation for quality and performance standards had already preceded him. He also returned with an absolute belief that war was about to become a reality. Solar aircraft turned its production to the war effort, and Solar's manifolds became a critical part of the Allied bid for air superiority. The P-38 Lightning, the B-29 Flying Fortress, the P-47 Thunderbolt. In all, 18,000 military planes relied on Solar's workforce, a workforce that had reached 5,000 employees. For security reasons, the company expanded into an old Ford plant in Des Moines, Iowa. Combined with San Diego's work, new production records were set every month. The war effort also changed the way Solar worked. For the first time, women joined men on the factory floor. Doris Moore was the first, but as the war continued, so did the numbers and respect for female factory workers. Another aspect of World War II was the government's recognition of Solar's ability to solve a wide variety of heat exchange problems. Solar set up a test cell for research and development of new products and was contracted to design a way to spray mosquitoes to stop the spread of malaria, as well as develop smoke screens to hide ships. Now those may sound like odd activities, but a young solar engineer, Paul Pitt, figured out a way to add fuel to the exhaust system that would create clouds of smoke. Pitt's careful testing also showed an actual increase in thrust. Out of this project, Solar created and was awarded a patent for the first jet engine afterburner, a concept that's still used on military planes around the world. From a wildcat company that began in a fish cannery, Solar Aircraft emerged from the war a major manufacturing company with 5,000 employees. It had new management skills and operational systems, expertise in hard-to-work stainless steel and exotic metals, a can-do attitude top to bottom, and dedication to seeing the job through. Solar was time and time again honored for its work, including three Navy E awards, the top recognition in the country for quality work. But the impact of the war was sharply felt in an even more basic way. 1,400 Solar employees left their jobs and put on uniforms. Some would never return. They had made the ultimate sacrifice so that all of us could continue to live in freedom. For the veterans who returned to Solar, the post-war years were tough times. There were layoffs. The company diversified to pick up what work it could. Some projects were significant, like work on jet engines and newly created rocket engines for the WAC Corporal. Other work was less sophisticated, but maybe a lot more fun to do. Midget race cars became a pretty successful product line. For a time, the company turned out milk trucks, stainless steel caskets, redwood patio furniture, and yes, even kitchen sinks. It may all sound silly now, but employment had dropped from 5,000 to 850, and anything that could keep the doors open was part of the solution. Solar was still a company almost entirely dependent on government contracts, and the company's finances were tied to the ups and downs of military spending. 
but things were starting to change. Military contracts were leading the company into an era of solar designed and owned turbine engines. One of these contracts was with the Navy. They needed a small, portable, and reliable shipboard power source to fight fires. Solar solution? The Mars 80, a proprietary design gas turbine created and built by Solar. Then the Air Force awarded the company a contract to adapt the unit into an auxiliary power unit, or APU, to start jet engines. The APU was adapted for other in-flight power uses as well. Another government contract from the Bureau of Ships called for the development of a turbine propulsion system in both single and dual shaft configurations. The company took up the development and Solar designed and manufactured the first of its Jupiter engines. By the time the Navy installed and tested the Jupiter, Solar had a second turbine engine that could be called its own. The company also bought a boat and installed a turbine. Called the Meteor, it cruised San Diego Bay at 26 knots. Now, with both the Mars and Jupiter turbines, Solar had products that raised the hopes for developing a commercial turbine market. The Harbor Drive facility was undergoing changes. In 1950, the Bill James patio area was named to honor the drop hammer operator who had kept the faith in his solar team. Company employees volunteered their weekends and their labor, and the company supplied the materials to build the All Faith Chapel. It was dedicated in September of 1953. The overall plant stretched to Laurel Street. Plans were made to add a modern three-story office building to front Harbor Drive and transitions were taking place within management. In 1956, after 29 years, Ned Price resigned as president. Under Price, the company had gone from an almost bankrupt dream into one of America's 500 largest corporations with over $52 million in annual sales. Price named Herb Kunzel as his successor. But Kunzel didn't inherit an easy job. The Department of Defense called him and other defense contractors to Washington to tell them of the government's decision to shift spending away from jets and turbine engines into new programs for rockets and missiles. Kunzel would have to draw on all his legal and business skills to lead the company into a new era, an era that moved the company into aerospace production. In 1957, Morris Sievert joined the company with the title of Assistant Manager of Industrial Gas Turbine Sales. A tough job because at the time, there were no sales. Jet engine components and afterburners had caused the expansion of solar in Des Moines, Iowa. After just eight years with the shift in defense spending, the jet engine business had dried up. The plant closed in 1959. Solar not only had to consolidate operations, Kunzel had to retool the company. As Kunzel worked to build financial reserves, solar came under attack by a corporate raider that wanted to grab the cash and break up the company. Kunzel set about the task of finding a white knight, some major corporation that would understand the value of the company's turbine technology and had the wisdom to keep solar intact. International Harvester felt it had missed a chance to be an early leader in diesel engines. IH wanted solar's emerging turbine technology. The Solar IH Turbostar was a vanguard project in the new parent company's desire to adapt turbine technology to more traditional diesel applications. Aerospace work continued as the company's backbone and reached its zenith with the manned astronaut program depending on solar built antenna for communications. The company's research and expertise in high temperature metallurgy and protective coatings was deployed with the Apollo 11 landing on the moon. Solar's beryllium frames for the nuclear auxiliary power units provided 20 years of service as mankind took its greatest leap. Go for landing, over. Go for landing, 3,000 feet. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. The move to products for industrial applications began to take shape. Morris Sievert was able to break through to the industrial sales market. He made the first ever sale of a Jupiter to Texas Eastern Transmission and quickly added three more units in New Mexico. But selling these newfangled engines wasn't always easy. In the early days, in order to uh, introduce the turbine to industry, we put a Jupiter engine on the uh, back of a pickup truck. And I took it around uh, 
to various cities in, uh, in which uh, industries were located and demonstrated it for the, uh, for the prospective users. And the most interesting story perhaps uh, happened in uh, Midland, Texas, where I was to demonstrate to a Phillips Petroleum uh, uh, plant that was outside of town. And uh, as the demonstration proceeded, uh, I asked the customer if he would like to start the engine, in which, uh, at which time he uh, denied that he wanted to have anything to do with it. And so I pushed the button. And as the Jupiter accelerated, it had a very, very loud sound. And by the time the engine came to full speed, the customer was running at uh, full speed and was about 40 yards from the machine. When I got back to San Diego, Herb Quinzel said, well, how did it go? Did you make a sale? And I said, well, very close, very close. <laughs> at the very start of his sales efforts, Sievert, who had an engineering degree, huddled Solar's development team with potential clients. Solar listened to the client's ideas and needs. One of the immediate results was the clear need to couple the turbine engine with driven equipment, such as compressors, generators, and pumps. The package concept, a complete unit on a skid, set an important new trend in the industry. In 1960, the company shipped its first commercial Saturn. By year's end, Solar had placed 26 of the 1,000 horsepower engines, 86 were sold the next year, 200 the next. Within five years, Solar was doing business with two-thirds of the nation's gas transmission companies. And the market still offered a world of opportunity. In 1966, Solar's first international installation came online in Agajari, Iran. The international expansion of Solar, with a new office in Belgium, was underway. And Rose Canyon in San Diego opened the same year to match production to the newly emerging market. Solar helped bolster its sales efforts by opening the first turbine training school for clients. Field offices were staffed to support after-sales service. And to match the shift in the company's activities, the company name changed from Solar Aircraft to Solar Turbines International, a subsidiary of International Harvester. In 67, the 1,000th Saturn was shipped. That same year, Solar installed its first offshore unit. To meet market demand, more powerful turbines were added to the product line. The first Centaur, rated at 2,700 horsepower, was bought by El Paso Gas and Electric. In 1973, Solar made the first sale to the Soviet Union. And maybe it's just a small footnote, but Solar also provided the emergency power unit for the White House emergency hotline to the Kremlin. Solar products were finding their place in providing power that contributed to the new global economy. After 14 years as president, Herb Kunzel retired. Kunzel had worked to ensure Solar stayed in business and oversaw a 300% growth under International Harvester. In August 1973, Morris Sievert followed Price and Kunzel as the third president of the company. Sievert continued the Solar concept of combining research, engineering, manufacturing, and field service support into a unified effort. In 1974, the company broke ground on San Diego's Kearney Mesa facility. Two years later, March 1976, the facility opened, supporting package assembly, test, and compressor build. Under Sievert's presidency, longtime head of engineering Paul Pitt and his team of designers came up with Solar's largest engine yet, the Mars. It was coupled with the newly designed C601 compressor. In 1977, the first Mars set was installed for Alberta gas trunk lines. Pitt soon retired, but the Mars would go on to become one of Solar's best-selling product lines. But before the Mars could prove its investment worth, it stood at the center of a major controversy. International Harvester had supported Solar and had allowed Solar the time needed to develop its turbine sales. Eventually, the Mars project came under fire as a costly new product at a time when Harvester was facing potential bankruptcy. Solar was now for sale. John Hansen was named president. And along came Caterpillar, a world leader whose management was aware of Solar's capabilities. We want to uh, express a word of special thanks uh, to all the employees here for having been cooperative, for having retained their composure, 
and uh, for their patience uh, while all this is going on. And now we're anxious to, uh, to get on with the job here, and uh, this is indeed a very significant moment for us, and uh, one that we uh, have a lot of enthusiasm for and uh, a great deal of optimism about. Hansen set about restructuring solar. Caterpillar backed up its belief in turbine technology by investing millions to modernize solar's production equipment. The new parent company soon added the financial strength of Caterpillar Capital to enhance Solar's sales efforts and customer support. Solar struggled through a period of re-entrenchment in the oil and gas industry. A lot of employees left the company as Solar had to face the reality of cost cutting to survive increased global competition. In 1987, Glenn Barton moved to San Diego to take over Solar's corner office. He had come up through the ranks at Caterpillar and he brought a new emphasis on product quality to Solar. Barton oversaw Solar's first sale to China and the sale of the 100th Mars turbine. Solar's mission of supporting sales was given a boost when the company bought a facility near Houston. The facility, now TurboFab, was an ideal fit for supporting base manufacturing for Solar's clients in the Gulf of Mexico. Along with Caterpillar's support came a refinement in management techniques, organizational design, and corporate philosophy. Quality, cost control, and sales support were essential. And Caterpillar's global operations put a new emphasis on worldwide leadership. Rich Thompson took over as president in 89 and is credited with building Solar's customer service business, which today accounts for nearly half of the company's revenues. Jim Owens assumed the role in 1990 and streamlined the business with his focus on quality, Class A, ISO, teams, and social responsibility. Don Ings was next in line as the company saw record growth year after year and Solar's winning of the U.S. Malcolm Baldridge National Quality Award. And Gary Strop, Solar's current president, has led the company through significant change, growth in a down market, and improved profitability. Solar has again proven it can withstand market changes and come out in a very competitive leadership position. From the low point of the 80s, sales tripled in the 90s. Market diversity within oil and gas and power generation continue to provide the balance needed to profitably grow the business. And Solar now enjoys global leadership within the mid-range industrial gas turbine market. 75% of Solar's revenue is generated from outside the United States from products built in America. And today, nearly 5,000 people work for Solar in 45 offices around the globe, stationed in locations where our customers live and work. Solar has reduced manufacturing costs while cutting lead time from order to delivery to previously undreamed of schedules. The company researched, developed, and patented exclusive techniques for protecting the environment with the unique Solonox emissions control systems. Solar has developed and deployed remote monitoring systems to reduce costs and increase online availability. All this while continuing research in new ceramic materials and ever enhanced efficiency and performance designs. And now, with the Six Sigma culture change driving for fact and data supported decisions, Solar is in position to again improve how employees work. Because it's how employees work together that has been a special source of Solar pride. A sense of pride that's been perfectly clear to those with a unique perspective within the company. We made a business that wasn't there before. I'm proud to have been a part of the Solar Spirit, and I'm equally proud of what you and the company are doing today. Well, first and foremost, uh, you're a leader today because you've really listened to the voice of the customer. And I think that's well embedded within the solar organization. I think you're extremely well placed to be a competitor throughout the next 75 years. It is truly a milestone and an achievement worth pausing to reflect upon that solar is a vibrant, healthy, dynamic, growing company in its 75th year. First and foremost, certainly the people that I worked with here and the opportunities to learn together and developing what I think were really a good set of winning business strategies. It was a community that worked well together for a lot of civic activities, a tremendous amount of community pride. I have spent most of my career at Solar, and there is no question in my mind that it is the people and your ability to adapt to change that has made Solar successful through 75 years. 
our spirit, our people, our commitment to both our customers and our communities. These and many other things make me very proud to be here during Solar 75th. Happy birthday, Solar. Shortly before Edmund Price left Solar, he looked back on his life's work and wrote a column in the company newsletter, The Solar Blast, about life being like a jigsaw puzzle. Sometimes how the pieces go together doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. But Price believed that somewhere in the puzzle lay opportunities and solutions. And if we just stepped back and took a larger look, we'd see how it all fit together. How opportunity led to solutions that led to success. And how that led to the next and higher level of opportunity, success, and fulfillment as individuals and as a company. So when we look back on 75 years of solar, how a fledgling aircraft company tried to combine new engine technology with new techniques in metal framing, how along the way there were cycles of economic downturn, global conflict, merger and acquisition, how expertise in working with hot gases and fluids in government contracts and aerospace work were ultimately brought together in commercial turbine technology, and how commitment to quality and to the customer time and time again lifted solar above the competition and up a rung on the ladder of success. During these 75 years, everyone who has worked at solar has reason to be proud of their accomplishments. But it remains for the men and women of today's solar throughout the company and around the globe to take a special moment to reflect, to step back and look at how they too are daily adding to a company legacy. Because as solar pushes toward its first century, it's how solar fits together in all its diverse jobs and responsibilities that turns opportunities into company-wide solutions. Congratulations, Solar. 75 and getting better. <laughs>